Hi, welcome to Not About You. Not About You is a podcast about identity and social justice. The premise of the show is simple. I wanted to ask marginalized folks to tell a white guy, that's me, what question or questions they wish they never had to hear again. They did just that, and then we talked. I'm Levi. I'm the host and producer of the show. I make podcasts, produce theater, and write and do arts education. Also, I've been a comedy writer and performer my entire adult life, so these conversations are full of humor. I've set up a voicemail line, 612-361-9261, where you can share comments, suggestions, and personal stories of your own that may be used in future episodes of the podcast. This episode is my conversation with Hannah. They have a mixture of public and personal life activism, so Hannah asked to just use their first name. You can connect with the show on Twitter at notaboutyoupod.com, or on Facebook, slash Not About You. The hashtag is NAPOD, N-A-Y-P-O-D. Thanks for listening. This is Not About You. My name is Hannah. I am a sex educator, a graphic artist, and a fat activist, and I am a non-binary trans person. Uh, Well, first, thanks for talking to me. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. (laughs) I will say I've known you for a long time. Yeah. uh, In the improv world. Yeah, I was calculating. I think think we probably met in maybe 2002. That sounds accurate. At at the comedy sports. Yeah. At the local comedy sports. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet hangout. For so that's like almost 15 years. It is. Yeah. But we've probably had three real conversations. I know, right? <laughs> Plenty of bits. Got a lot of history. A lot of, lot of rich history of being in the same building. But it is probably more conversations than with a lot of other improvisers. That's true. Yeah. So Because you will have a real conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for noticing. It's hard, it's hard not to. <laughs> Every once in a while, you're not making a dumb joke. Right. Um, Thanks, buddy. Well, so you just made a long list of words. It's true. You know, shorter than some, longer than others. True, 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 true. Yeah. I guess if I were, if I were really gonna, gonna really unpack all of the identity stuff, you know, there's, obviously there's stuff I'm not saying in there, like the fact that like I'm white, that's Mm. a thing. And I'm like... Although it's also a social construct, so that's... Right. Well, (laughs) so are, so are all of them, all the best identities. That's true. Gender, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Let's get into that. So, I mean, I I could also say like, I'm a queer non-binary trans person. And Mm. there's also different words out there in the world that, that fit fine for me. And I choose to use them at different times. Like a lot of times I'll say that I'm gender non-conforming or if I'm typing and I'm in a hurry, I'll just say GNC, which makes people think of like strip mall vitamin stores. Yeah. I think sometimes in the Midwest, yeah. which I mean, is not how I identify. You're into jacked up protein right. based. <laughs> right. I, people can't see me because it's a podcast, but I am just one of those large white plastic jars full of protein yeah. powder. That yeah. is actually what You're I... You're mostly whey according right. to your label. <laughs> right. A little bit. Just a little bit of soy protein. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, like I'll use the word gender nonconforming sometimes. There was, there was a time when I, I talked about being gender queer, but now I really like using the term non-binary trans person mm-hmm. because I, I, like for me, it makes it as clear as possible to folks that I'm not a girl, that I'm not a woman, that I'm not a chick. So... If I actually say like non-binary trans person, I think a lot of times that's much clearer. It's like a clearer, louder message right off the bat to folks like, hey, you need to stop for a second and maybe adjust some language, maybe adjust some perceptions. So what is the reaction when you, whether it be in a corrective context Mm -hmm. or just wherever the situation is where that, a piece of that information comes out? Yeah. Yeah. What do you get back from folks? Is there a by and large common thing of confusion, mm-hmm. excitement, denial? <laughs> like what? Um, the stages of grief? Usually people. Usually people. Well, here's the thing. So so part of my lived experience as like a non-binary person is that I, I like 100% pass really easily as just like kind of a soft butch lady. Mm. So... 
I don't, I have like the, the privilege in many, in many instances of, in most instances, I have the privilege of just like passing as someone who's not right. visibly trans. I mean, I look kind of gender non-conforming, I think, to some people, but I'm, you know, I'm white and I have like sparkly blue eyes yeah. and yeah. like, I'm really cute. So, <laughs> so I don't I, want to objectify you, but I, you are really cute. I'm really cute. But I, I have like a pretty, for, for the majority of like strangers I meet in public in like the Twin Cities metro area, I have what is often perceived as a pretty non-threatening, like easy to deal with kind of like physical presentation. Yeah. And so... And you're, I mean, this is also a generalization, but you're fairly laid back in Um, your manner. Well, I, you know, I've worked in customer service for many years, I guess is the best way to put that. And so... And having a background in like theater, like improvisational performance stuff allows me to like I have I've had the opportunity to build skill sets where I can like navigate through most like stranger situations pretty easily here in like Minneapolis at a gas station, you know, so really most of the people who I've talked to about my gender identity, like, and about, you know, my sexual orientation too, are people that I know really well, where I've, I've brought it up. Cause I'm like, listen, I talk to you all the time. Let's talk about the words that you should use when you're talking with me. So really most, I would say like 99% of the people I've talked to about my gender identity are like, Oh, fantastic. Tell me more. I feel so honored. Also, I'm gonna screw this up constantly. Mm-hmm. So Let's talk about that. And a lot of times the conversations turn into more of that. Yeah. <laughs> like, so that's great. I'm excited for you. But also, like, I am already freaking out with how many mistakes I'm going to make. And so, you know, for a little while, sometimes our relationship becomes about, like, their anxiety about the mistakes they're going to make and how they don't want to hurt my feelings. So there's a little, a little bit of that sometimes. Yeah. But. Well, I, I want to. So there's two things from there yeah. that I think are really interesting mm-hmm. and could, there could be help there for people who are sort of engaging in these ideas. One is, it sounds like you often have to decide to be in that discomfort space or to call out the discomfort. Yeah. So maybe you're feeling yeah, it yeah. and you have to decide to sort of green light, hey, there's some discomfort happening. You're going to be a part of that. For a yeah. Moment. And that's exactly right. And so for me, and also I use like gender neutral pronouns. I use they, them. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because like... When we talk about pronouns, a lot of times we'll say, I use they, them, but how often do I really talk about myself? Really what it is is that I would like other people to use those pronouns when they talk about me. So I hand people this little this little language package, and I always choose who I hand that to because I'm not going to... I'm not going to talk to the lady at the checking me out at the container store in Edina and be like, listen, could you... We're going to spend a lot of time together, <laughs> so it's important to me... The, so, so it's it's kind of it's always this budgeting yeah. for me. It's like this emotional budgeting of like how much you have to, to right, like spend. what stake do I have in it, and right. how much do I have to spend, and and you know the people that I care about, where I want to have like, you know, I want to continue to talk to them all the time and have like meaningful relationships with them, and I want to give them the opportunity to be my ally in situations when I'm not there, and I know that they're gonna like honor that and appreciate it. Then we'll totally go in for like this long involved talk about like how gender works and like my life and how I feel and things. But other times I'm just like, you know what, this person's never going to get it anyway. I see them once a year, high fives, whatever. Well, that also seems like you're, you're investing in your own well being because if it's someone you're around a lot, yeah, totally. like unintentional microaggressions could happen. Yeah. Frequently. And I, and you know, and I have a lot of really close friends who really don't have any, who are, who are uh, like, spend all of their time in, like, like, cis-centric. I'm using words cis-centric Yeah, let's right break now. down, just so people know what cis-centric is. Yeah. That's a really, like... That's a, that's a good one, what? right? That's, like, a $10 academic word. So, I'm saying cis-centric, and cis comes from cisgender, and that is a word that and means... that's C-I-S, if yes, someone wants to C- Google it. Yeah. C-I-S is cis. So, there's cisgender people, and there are transgender people, and cisgender just means... If you're cisgender, that means that you're someone who's like lived gender identity and uh, just the way you feel about your gender happens to match up with the sex that you're assigned at birth that's on your birth certificate. Like, hey, everything match up there, match up there. I'm just living my life. And is there a layer that it kind of also reflects like society agrees with 
what how you feel about yourself. Like, um, a, like people's people will assume about you. I mean, I don't know yeah, if that's the technical definition, but I, yeah, I mean, I think I like the functional part of it is people are gonna like, when like, I walk around, people think I'm a man, <clears throat> and that is how I think. And of that's myself, actually too. match up there. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a that's actually a, a a nice thing to bring up because you know gender is so much about perception and meaning. it's an external thing. I right? mean, that's what gender is. Gender is a system of meaning hmm. that we have created so that we it's it's like. It's like uh, the little tags at the record store that tell you where to find the, the band that you yeah. want. So, like, if you're at Cheapo, you're like, wait, what is modern rock and what is pop? I don't know. Yeah. Like, And some stores just have music. Right. Like, which Because they don't want to put in the energy. Right. Like, which I want to really go deeper on this Great, metaphor. but I want to find the band. Like, yeah. where, where are the Smiths? Are they in pop or are right. they in modern rock? Well, like, and if you ask, you know. Exactly. The Smiths, <laughs> they, they don't want to be in any of those you, categories. They probably they're, wouldn't tell you. They're, they're genre they're, non-conforming. Because they're still in a fight. <laughs> the point is, cisgender means you're not trans. Hmm. So I'm shortening both those words. There's cis and there's trans. And, you know, cisgender is one of those really interesting words where, which I'm, I'm sure you've talked about on other episodes, where it's like, uh-huh. it's a word that is applied to a group of people who aren't used to having words applied to them. Hmm. So... So, you know, there's a lot of people who are like, no, I don't accept that label. I'm not cisgender. And it's like, well, there are words. We have to use words to describe people. Well, so, so I, let's, I would love to, to go in on that a little bit. Because sure. I think that's true with white as well. Oh, yeah. Which is this thing of a cis person like myself mm-hmm. and a white person also like myself. Yeah. We don't have the experience generally of being othered. Like, we are the ones who other mm-hmm. people. And cis, I think puts on all kinds of alarm bells of, wait, now I'm suddenly a thing? Mm-hmm. I have always been the default, not a thing person. Yeah, exactly. So can you talk about why that is important, actually, for sure. someone who is trans <laughs> to not just them be the weirdo, but to have an acknowledgement that we yeah. all are just being described in various ways? Well, I think you summed it up. <laughs> I think you did it. <laughs> That's so all I wanted to hear. I'll be on my way. Farewell. Goodbye now. Um, the... Uh, no, I mean, I, I think you already articulated it, and I can I can add to it, like from my own like from my own experience, I can say that the reason why it is important to talk about marginalized identities in the same context as non marginalized identities is because, well, like here's an example. So, I, like growing up in the middle of Wisconsin and like a predominantly white middle class community in like the 80s and 90s, I just didn't know that trans people existed. I just didn't know that was a thing. I never came across it because I was completely immersed in this normative, cis-centric, cis-normative environment. And, you know, and lots of other centric normative things too. Like really, really, you know, really heteronormative. And I went to high school in the 90s and we had a gay straight alliance, like one of the first ones in the country, which was phenomenal for me because it was like my first exposure to like oh there are actually people who have a whole bunch of different identities that are maybe invisible as I'm walking down like the high school hallway for example but I still really didn't have any context for gender nonconformity or for any kind of like trans identities other so than So is it a thing you could feel not fitting but you couldn't put words to not well, fitting or what's the I wonder how personalized I can make that that's, idea. That's what, you can totally ask about that. I, I've thought about that a lot because there is, there's also this like common cultural narrative mm-hmm. of like being trans is a thing because I knew when I was three years old. Yeah, I think people are really curious right? about that. That's like, that's like a, a narrative that is out there that people rely on to sort of like justify the, the reality of transness. Mm-hmm. Of like, well, since I knew when I was a kid, that means it's a real thing. But the fact is, like, not all trans people have that experience. And actually, that's that's one of those narratives that has really been pushed forward over the decades, like over the 20th century, because it was really important for folks who wanted, like, gender affirming surgery or like any kind of like medical transition. They had to have those narratives like on record, like it's OK for me to have this surgery because once, ever since I was a child, I knew this was a thing. Mm. So that's definitely some people's like real lived experience, but it's not everybody's. And I think it's important to sort of like deconstruct that sometimes. And Yeah, because yeah. it it's it's often viewed, I think, and I don't want to conflate too much, but the idea of sexuality being inborn is this powerful argument people make. But it's this innate biological to prove that thing that's real. real. Yeah. Because we won't accept it otherwise. Right. And that feels like it has so much other 
baggage associated to it. Yeah, it can about be really, other people getting yeah. to decide who you are, how you are, why you are. It can be really complicated once you start to to only legitimize identities that like are biologically real right, from like from book. what age, you yeah. know. <laughs> so so I think it's important for for all of us to like listen for those other narratives. Mm-hmm. Like and and mine for example is that like I never felt particularly attached to a gender identity, mm-hmm. but I didn't know there were I didn't know that there was anything other than two binary options. And I didn't think that I was, I didn't struggle with, with like conflicted feelings about gender because I didn't really, I wasn't really drawn to male identity any more than I was to female. So I just kind of took everybody's word for it. I was like, yeah, sure. I'm a girl. Okay, sweet. That's what you're telling me. Awesome. And then, you know, a lot of times what I, what I tell people is that like, I just sort of thought that, that my relationship to femaleness and femininity was just as awkward as everything else in young mm. adulthood, you know? Yeah. And then I sort of feel like what happened was I was like, well, it's like a pair of pants where you're like, well, I guess pants are just supposed to be this uncomfortable. This is all I've ever known. Like, this is just how it feels to walk around in a pair oh, of pants. Man. And then after a while, I think some people are like, I've had these pants on backwards the whole time and nobody told me that the zipper is supposed to be in the front. Oh my God, this is so much more comfortable. And I think for me, it's like, I've been wearing a shirt as a pair of pants this whole time. Like, no wonder this, no wonder these made no sense. And there's this drafty hole and like, I should have been wearing this on top. So that is like a very flawed analogy, but well, makes, I love that analogy because I think we have, we all have something like that in our lives. Yeah. And people I, who are like, I thought eating food was supposed to give you a stomach ache and you're right. like, no, no, this, you can't tolerate like, this kind of food. I thought that's what everything looked like, but it turns out that I need glasses. Yeah, yeah, or, like, yeah. Right. So, so again, like trans identities are so beautifully complicated and like i i don't think i don't have experiences talking about anything else when it comes to identity politics where there's this you could stop along the way and make like 300 different caveats and qualifications and because it's it's all tied into identity politics politics is tied into like body politics yeah and you know there are lots of parts of trans experience that for for many many people are like medicalized and have to do with like but like not like I guess what I mean to say is that for for a lot of trans people like physical transition and like becoming more comfortable in their bodies is a process that's really medical and is really important to them and that's what fits for them that's what they need and then for other trans people it's that's just not a part of what they need and like I'm a person like that where I the the like medical transition steps that I've taken for the majority of people wouldn't even be seen as medical transition mm-hmm. at all. Like, I mean, you've got an arm removed. I do so. have a robotic arm, <laughs> and there's the lasers. But other could, than that, I couldn't help. Other I than just, that, like the like, idea that you say it, it, most people wouldn't even notice. Most people wouldn't even notice I that I actually just, I actually just levitate like three quarters of an inch off the ground yeah. all the time. But I just wear shoes, so you don't. Well, notice people it. are in our phone so much, we don't even see that. You don't stuff. even see. <laughs> well, for me, I mean, like I, I you, here, here's a glimpse into the yeah. life of a uterus owner. So yeah. you can take hormonal birth control pills. There's lots of different types of birth control, and some of them involve hormones, and some don't. And one of the beautiful. But they're all. Like, like wrong against <laughs> against nature. They are all a terrible crime against nature. They are the they are the best. They are the greatest. I'm a fan, and I'm a huge fan. And one of the things you can do with hormonal birth control is you can change the way your menstrual cycle works. So you can take birth control pills if you got a uterus. You can take birth control pills and not have a period like ever, if you don't want it. And there's lots of other birth control methods you can do that with. And so when I talk about like my experience as a non-binary trans person and my experience with like choosing different kinds of transition or not, that's really the only thing that I've done with my body that makes me feel closer to the the genderedness of a body that feels comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are like, well, that's not really a thing. And I'm like, well, I'm doing it. So it's a thing. (laughs) So it's actually a thing. Okay, we should we should layer back out like four different steps because what else were we talking about? Well, no, but the, so you yeah. brought. I mean, we can try. I want to trace back because there is a. I, I think you touched on it, but there is this thing of like, so much of who we are, mm-hmm. 
is about what someone tells us we are and either agreeing or bouncing against that. Yeah, and for a non-binary identity, so much of that, it's it's almost all like oppositionally defined, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So the only reason I was able to figure out like, oh, oh, there's actually a thing that I'm feeling. It's not just discomfort with with this assigned gender. I'm not just going to be an uncomfortable person forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there is actually a thing that I can identify with instead of just identifying against. I didn't figure out that it was like a, a thing you could do. Yeah. Until I had the like the privilege of like being in an undergrad at the time it was women's studies. Now most programs are gender studies, but mm -hmm. I was in a women's studies program at the University of Minnesota and they kept talking about queer theory and they kept I just basically got an introduction to like what the, like gender theory, like the fact that, that gender isn't the same thing as sex and mm -hmm. that both gender and sex are actually just like systems of meaning that humans have figured out how to do in different cultures. We have different ways of understanding sex and different ways of understanding gender and all the language around that isn't just this thing that you have to find your place in. It's actually something that you can create a place for yourself within. Well, so we've codified a lot of that. And, and yeah. when I say we, it's sort of very cultural, but like in the U.S., there's some codified ideas about sexuality, codified mm -hmm. ideas about gender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's just a few. Just, <laughs> just a couple. <laughs> I, yeah. I think of the attachment to science mm -hmm. around gender. You know, there's like in the Olympics, the is this person allowed to compete as a... Oh, in, yeah, in it's the a female mess. category, do they have enough blah, blah, blah? That's, pro you're, uh, that's a great thing to bring up because that probably is, I, I imagine, for people who don't have gender-critical conversations in their everyday life, mm -hmm. the Olympics is probably an entry point for a lot of people into like, wait a second. And then mean, they start having opinions. You can pull this thing apart? Yeah. And like, it's actually like, like the idea of whether someone is a man or someone is a woman can actually be questioned and examined and right. but I, become I, a nightmare for that person. <laughs> I think there's tension around that, mm -hmm. and it seems reminiscent to me of the how much percentage of your blood do you need to be considered a native person, mm -hmm. or uh, you know there was a lot of like blood testing to determine your race, which is not a biological imperative. Well, yeah, I and think... I wonder why people have this desire for definitive proof of something. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wonder if you can speak to. Well, right now, there's. I feel like gender nonconformity or um, the use of trans and cis. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to push into the that is some fad that is happening. Like a lot of people are trying to be interesting and have ide yeah, identities. Yeah, I think especially when it comes to like non-binary identities. Yeah. Or or like trans people who who don't experience like daily, who don't struggle daily with right. like body dysphoria, like right. gender dysphoria. There, yeah, there is a lot of that out there. I, I mean, I think what you're talking about is the collision of the, the, the like awkward slow motion fight between two house cats that happens on YouTube. That happens when when you actually have to look at like lived experience and you're still trying to do it through the lens of these systems of meaning that we've built up over over the generations. The the way that. I mean, being being human is like a being a weird, awesome, messy bag of juice, right? So like, that's scary. Yeah. That's very scary to to like look at the human condition and all of its physical complexity and all of its emotional complexity and the way that we make ourselves feel safe is by making sense of it, you know. And I, I mean, I always think of I always think of like you know like people trying to figure out like you know thousands of whatever years ago like i'm a historian yes. so go on pay attention to my precise language here professor hannah will explain I, everything i just think of like i was a big fan of greek myths when i was a kid because i really liked how you could read these stories and be like oh i see they were people were freaked out by storms and so they invented yeah. this this guy who was in charge of storms that yeah. you could you know give presents to and maybe he wouldn't give you a scary storm or i'm talking about zeus i'm talking about zeus that guy oh man talk about he Talk probably had about, some, some issues. Probably. Good Lord, you want to read about consent issues. Anyway, <laughs> so that was like... Uh, the, uh, that is very true. Like, yeah, Zeus is a real creeper. So, uh, But I always, I always really loved reading uh, like, like Norse mythology and Greek mythology as a kid because I was like, oh, 
oh, we haven't always known everything. Right. And for me, that was like one of the first glimpses of like, oh, really? People just like walk around on this earth trying to like make up make up systems that make us feel safer and like we understand everything. But then obviously culture changes and cycles and, and we learn more stuff about ourselves over over the generations. And so like, well, then you know, I, now I, we're at now we're at a point where more and more people are able to figure out like at an earlier and earlier age, thanks internet, the fact that there might be other people out there who have like the same questions about gender that they do. And so sometimes I laugh because like I'm 36 and I'm on Tumblr and I'm just like, oh man, when I was 16, I had like no idea that gender non-conforming people existed other than like a few fictional drag queens I had seen in the occasional movie. And like now, you know, it's just amazing to like compare and contrast like, like being a youth in pre-internet times, like my gender literacy really didn't develop until I was in college. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And had some internet and had like access to other parts of culture. Yeah. That, I, I mean, I'm 38, so I You're feeling me then. The exact same experience. Yeah. yeah. Around. T playing Oregon Trail in elementary school really didn't give me the no. exposure to gender nonconformity. That it I, didn't even... That, Help me understand that there was a lot of sexism. I mean, I should have. Right. I, I think the Oregon Trail, Oregon Trail, <laughs> failed us. It failed us all as a generation. Uh, <laughs> I want to know why. Why does a pronoun matter? For each of these ten episodes of Not About You, I put out requests for folks to call in with responses to questions that come up in each episode. So a few people left voicemails, and I'll be sharing some of those in the middle of some of these conversations. You have reached the Not About You voicemail line. Leave a message after the tone. Hey, Levi. It's Saj. Uh, I'm just responding to the question, uh, why do pronouns matter? Uh, I think right now uh, they're super important. I mean, they've always been important, but I feel like now especially, like, we're, we've come uh, – we're in the year 2016, and I feel like we shouldn't assume someone's gender just by the way they look. Uh, I personally feel gender is a construct. So just, like, checking in and asking someone about a pronoun, like, even, like, right if you're meeting someone new for the first time, I've done this a couple times where I've had check-ins before where people have been like, hi, my name is so-and-so, and I identify as he, his, or she, her, or they, them. And it's just really nice to just know, so that way you're not – uh, accidentally insulting somebody by saying the wrong pronoun. So I think it's important just to, just to always check um, because, again, we shouldn't assume. We should not assume just by the way somebody looks. And I would say the same goes oftentimes, like, you know, how people identify uh, for their race. A lot of times people might assume that you are one thing, but you might be another. So just checking in um, or letting them identify themselves and if you maybe identify them wrong, just being like, I'm sorry, I'm well going to correct that. Um, so, yeah, that's why I think it's important. Just because we've gotten to a place where we shouldn't assume things about people. Check in. It's nice. Get to know somebody a little bit more. That's all. Okay. Bye. Now let's get back to the conversation. I want to know why, why does a pronoun matter? Like, yeah. why does it matter if I call you they, them mm -hmm. versus she? And I don't know if you can speak to it. Mm -hmm. Why is that so challenging to people yeah. as an idea? And then literally challenging to change. Right, like right, right, right. Well, let's, let's talk about... Speak the... for everyone, first okay, of all. Okay, first of all, thank you for this opportunity to represent all people. Yes, go. Um, I appreciate that. No one that. will be mad at you. <laughs> No one, no one will be like, that's not my experience. Speaking um, of the internet. Yeah. So, so to, to your first question, like, I, I realize that you're not asking that because you, you don't know the answer. I realize you're asking because you're like, let's it's talk about setup. this. Yeah. It's, uh, Who's on first? So I want you to know no, that I, really I understand want to know. that. Thank you but for that. I think the best way to, for, for me, when I've been talking to friends who, who haven't dealt with, like, unfamiliar pronouns, who haven't dealt with, like, intentional pronoun use before, sometimes we start by talking about, like, well, what's your experience with pronouns? Like, like asking a cisgender person who has always sort of felt, who has felt in harmony with, 
with the language that people use about them, asking them to start to try to imagine what if that language was wrong 100% of the time. Mm. And not just wrong 100% of the time, but you were you also did not have any cultural tools available to you to let people know that it was wrong. Like if you were like, you know, I'm not so cool with that, or like, oh, that feels weird, like what the response to that would be. So first of all, just trying to imagine being misgendered constantly, like every second of the day. And once, once, once like people start to examine that, I think sometimes things can pop up like, like. It's a bummer to think about. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know if you know that. You know what? Take a break. Take a break from thinking about Oof. it. If you... I have and, been through a lot just and now. And just active rest, active yeah. rest, and back into it. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm just so happy to be back into the world. <laughs> no, you're supposed I to be am, doing it again. I'm, you're supposed to be thinking about it again. I'm normative. Oh, and boy. It's just... It's, it's, so, so sometimes I'll, I'll be like, well, imagine, you know, like every time you're in a store, if there's no department for you, or the the constant need to do this thing that's perceived as transgressive of of like shopping in a different clothing department or being like so there's so once you start to imagine all these different microaggressions that happen throughout the day for someone who is trans or who identifies as just gender nonconforming or something like that then the pronoun thing like you just have to sort of make sense of it within this context of constant constant struggle and constant microaggressions. So I'm sure you've talked about microaggressions on other A little, episodes. but not and, enough. Well, it's like... And we've talked about them, but we haven't talked about the term. About the... Yeah, well, it's... And why it actually, I think, is a really helpful way of understanding yeah. the fatigue. And I, I think sometimes people think like, well, microaggression, that means it's not that big of a deal, but the... the True, the, but it's constant. Right. So so that's the, that's the idea. It's like death by a thousand cuts. Yes. Kind of. It's... I think it's really useful for folks who don't have their own like yeah. lived like gender dissonant experience to just practice every once in a while like when you're in the parking lot at Target you're like okay when I go in I'm going to try to try to locate as many experiences as I can that have to do with my gender mm. so like you walk in and you're like looking at the layout of the store and what you need to buy and what departments you need to walk into and then how you might be perceived by other people as you walk into those departments. And then if you look like you might be in the wrong department and someone working there might be like, can I help you, sir? Or can I help you, ma'am? Or something like that. If you have to use the restroom, is there a like unisex one that you can find like near the pharmacy, mm -hmm. go target um, yeah. that, that you could use without someone speculating about whether you're in the correct restroom or not. And then when you check out, like, what does it mean? The items that you're putting on the belt, like, what do they mean to the person who's ringing you up? And how are they going to treat you? And there's a million other things. But if you just practice that, like, in a short-term kind of thing, I, f I find retail transactions are a great moment to examine all of those different, like, gender microaggressions yeah. that, that someone might deal with because... They well, it's the same reason that transaction um, transaction scenes are really popular with beginning improvisers because yeah. there's a script, there's a socially established script. So you know we, how it's supposed to go. You know how it's supposed to go, and yeah. it's all about like getting that money to change hands, exchanging goods and services for money, and being very cordial while you're doing it. And people who work in retail deal with like a million faces a day, and so it's their job to just like lubricate that mm -hmm. and like talk to people in a way that gives them a benign but positive experience. And a lot of times, gender is a way to do that. It's also the time when we, as people, talk the most to strangers. I think as like middle class folks, mm -hmm. like a lot of times, it's just like, oh, I talked to a waitress and a, I talked to a server and a and a whatever customer service representative today, and those were the strangers I talked to. So that, what am I trying to say? We're talking about microaggressions. Well, so I, you, you may, I mean, I think you've just given a great like field trip exercise. Yeah, that's what I, do. that's what I recommend is doing a field trip. Also the, uh, the, you know, if you, if you know a gender nonconforming person, go try and go into the store with them. Mm. That's good times. The thing that. And then on the behalf, shout at people, right? Right. Just yell at people. What I, what I like to tell my cisgender, like straight friends is just go for people's knees yeah. and knock them down. And then I can take it from there. Well, can Let's we talk on the floor? So, I'm just kidding. Kidding. No, I'm but like kidding. the, around advocacy, yeah. um, that yeah. idea of just daily constant microaggressions. Mm -hmm. Anytime I talk to anybody who mm -hmm. is, is living in spaces where that's frequent, which it turns out is most people, like yeah. pretty much everyone who's not like me. I always want to know, so I'm asking you, how are you not 
exhausted and angry all the time. Like, you are very thoughtful. You can talk to me about these things. Yeah. I'm sure you do get worn out, but I mean, sure. I don't understand why more people who are disenfranchised, underrepresented, yeah. marginalized, yeah, aren't like why cutting why the they're throat. able to. Because <laughs> that's, but I know also that's a yeah. perspective of like white straight cis male like that the, you're probably just not I hearing am about not it. Conditioned, I mean, yeah, this is all yeah. like decade, the last decade, a lot of it mm-hmm. is, but also I'm not conditioned to just like. I am individually, but I think my my prototypical like the group that I'm a part of. Yeah, we aren't. We are not. We don't have the, the endurance. Maybe and not. So, I mean, maybe you'd find out, but I think it would probably take generations of like. And that's what success know. would look like, right? right. <laughs> but like, well, how I are you not angry right now? I think. Or are you, and you're just being nice? I. This is what I look like when I'm enraged. No. Um. One of the, <laughs> one of the things that one of the things that for me as a as a a uh, geek, someone who's pretty active in in uh, the geek culture. Hmm. That's another part of your identity. One of the yeah, I didn't mention that a at the top, one. but it's a big deal. It's a big deal for me, and I. It's one of the reasons why I cry at Marvel movies, no matter how crappy they are. If the, if freaking Bruce Banner is in that movie, I will cry because for me, that's that's one of the. That for me, the Hulk is a touchstone. And it's funny because, of course, it's like it's it's a metaphor, and it's told through the story of of a sad white man. And so, so that's you know, how stories are told, right? I always forget. So the, um, what you need to do is find a story about a, a straight white man, and then whichever one is closest to you yeah, as a marginalized person, matter. and then you know you just pick that. But I like lacking when I was when I was a youth again lacking other cultural like easily accessible cultural representations of gender nonconforming people. Like, uh, I've had, like, a lifelong love of The Incredible Hulk because, and I, like, I got real misty at that uh, first Avengers movie when he's talking about, they're like, they're like, how do you keep it under control, man? And he's like, I'm just angry all the time. And Mark, Mark, old Ruffles, God bless him, he's in the middle of a terrible, terrible problem because he's producing a movie where a cisgender man is playing a trans woman. So that's its own thing. Come on, Ruffles. But Ruffles does a great job in that movie of just being a soft-spoken cupcake of a sweetheart person, and he just gets through it because he knows that that like first of all that anger is always there, and that's the you know he just keeps that fire like just stoked at a low level, and mm. that's how he kind of gets through it without letting it explode. And he knows he has to do that or it will explode. I think for a lot of marginalized people, it will. In my experience... No, I need you to speak for all more. I know, right? Did you see me catch uh-huh. myself? I really did. It that was, was fun. That was how I prepared. For, I was like, all right, how am I going to prepare to do this podcast with Levi? Well, I got to make sure to only talk about my experience. <laughs> That's how I get screwed up. So, I'm trying to trap you. So I know you almost got me. You're so wily. So in my experience, <clears throat> um, being, a, being able to be cool with this stuff the majority of the time and have the patience to explain it to my friends and my family it ends up serving me and just luckily i have the systems in place in my life where i can rest and recharge and get like 100 percent understanding and support Mm -hmm. from people who already know this stuff so i'm just lucky enough to have those things in place so i can recharge but being easygoing about this stuff is a survival mechanism for a lot of people i imagine that there are a lot of people of color for whom this might be a survival mechanism. You can't walk around angry all the time about this stuff. Like, it won't work. Well, I talked to Peggy Flanagan, and she said something I really liked when I asked a version of the question, and she said, yeah. because fuck them, that's why. Like, I I can't be miserable, then I yeah, lose. Yeah, you can't, yeah. And, I mean, there's a lot of people for whom they, they like... They don't have the support. They don't have the resources around them, and they are miserable and angry all the time. And like that's they like they should not be faulted for that, you know. Yeah. I think it, there's a lot of stuff around marginalized identities where people are told to like cheer up and like if you want your message heard, you need to like put a brave face on it. Smile. And spend time yeah. educating other people if you want the world to get better. It's up to you to do that. And so I really appreciate that you're asking that question because the fatigue is real. It is so so real for me. I get through a lot of it by joking and luckily I have a lot of friends who have great senses of humor and so like one time I was at Pizza Luce with 
with a lady friend of mine, which sounds like I'm courting her in Meet Me in St. Louis, but it's not true at all. It's just a friend of mine who is a cisgender woman who enjoys, like, the term lady. Like, you know, it's like, the Jerry Lewis version? My, yes, exactly. <laughs> I can't not say it. You it's can't. Like, that's my safe harbor around yeah. the term lady is thinking about Jerry Lewis. And then I'm like, oh, it is that yeah. obnoxious. It is well, great. he's a monster, too. So. Right, so it's perfect. So... <laughs> <laughs> but I was I was dining out at the the local pizza luce with uh, a cisgender female friend of mine Go who on. is like a power femme. Oh yeah, and who always gets called. Well, thanks a lot, thanks a lot, ma'am. Thanks a lot, miss. Like, are you ladies having a good time? And so when we're out together, we get ladies a yeah. lot, and we started counting because it was like I was like, it's not just me, right? Like this is happening every five seconds, and the one server called us ladies literally fourteen times. Wow. And it just became hilarious. Yeah. And so having an ally there with me for whom, like, like, I knew I had talked to her about this. I knew she was aware of it. Yeah. And the fact that we were able to, like, have that experience together, she was like, my God. And I was like, it's funny because this is happening, like, over a dozen times. But this is how it feels every time for me. And I love that you're here experiencing this and that it even feels ridiculous to you, someone who was, like, fine being called ladies. I like that you found the game of that. That's was, what that was. You I turned was, that into the game. Well, I was able to do that in that experience, right. and that that's what works for me. Yeah. And, yeah, not that you're not saying right. it. That's all everyone needs to do. So if we could just... Have fun with it. we could all just make it a... Let's, let's make up a song. Like, it doesn't really work that way. But, but like, fortunately, I was with the right person at the right time <laughs> in this, like, very safe pizza luce where yeah. it's like... Even if the server had realized, like, something's going on here, like, they would have been the odd person out. It would not have been a situation and I think where I was in danger at all. It's worth mentioning, I think Pizza Luce is a, is a dining establishment that is viewed as sort of staffed by progressive people who are, like, aware of the world. Well, like, think, that's a, a, a broad stereotype. But I just so people know, like, you were not in It was one of the suburban in a, ones. But yeah, but still. I still, like, you're not in, like, a hate monger restaurant. Right, we weren't at, like, like Cracker Barrel. Because I think a lot of people want to disavow their yeah. connection to being a perpetrator of microaggressions, but yeah. it's mostly because we're just not aware we're doing it. I think it's especially... And like, I only said disavow because of Marvel and you mentioning it, <laughs> and I feel like that's used a lot in my It is. I think you're right. I think you're right. The uh, ah, LaCroix, the refreshing taste of LaCroix. Oh, I got a new sponsor. Um, bing! A little sound happens every time you get one. The The reason why this is that why like gendered little tiny pieces of gendered language like that the reason why they are important to me it's not just because they stack up like they wouldn't be a big deal if they just happened once and they stack up and that's why they matter it's not just that for me it's that they are a direct window into how other people perceive me and gender is all about perception and we can't control how other people perceive us but sometimes we can influence it a little bit with our appearance and by asking people to speak about us in the ways that we would like. And so anytime a stranger uses a little piece of gendered language, it's a reminder to me that like, I'm just, I'm just a little bubble awash in a giant sea of like, of gendered meaning. And that ultimately as uncomfortable, like, like, it's just, I'm just always going to be inside of this system that makes me really uncomfortable, like deep down inside. I realized how uncomfortable it made me when I attended a conference for work and we had the, op- we had the, the opportunity to put our preferred pronouns on our name tag. And I was like, you know what, to hell with it. And I put they, them, because I was like, here it is. It's an option right here. I could do it. I'm in another state. No one's going to make fun of me. Like, all of these people will just do it. And, like, you never... It's, like, it's so rare to have that opportunity to just control how other people talk about you. And really, by extension, control how other people see you. So I was like, fuck it. They, them. Let's do this. And then for four days, I did not deal with a single piece of, like, gendered language. And it was like absurd (laughs) like it was really surreal how much it affected me and because it's so small but just knowing that knowing that it wasn't going to happen and then having it actually not happen and I was also in an environment where they had like um like all gender restrooms so just having like this little vacation from that like it was like almost it was like bewildering like how profoundly it affected me I just didn't know it was going to be like that 
And so then when I got home, I was like, listen, I work at a job where people will, people will use the pronouns that I request. So I'm going to try it just at work and just see, and like, just with my partner and just see, <laughs> like everybody was fine with it and it went fine and nothing happened. And my like deeply ingrained Midwestern fear of what if an awkward thing happens, like didn't ever, like I never died from that, <laughs> like in, in that, like several weeks when I was trying that. And so I was like, I don't, okay, I guess I'll just keep doing this for a while. And then I realized that that, like, once I got a taste of it, like it wasn't enough to just have it at work. And I was like, this, this is actually worth being out about with everybody. And so I think, I think I told my mom about it. And like, that was the tough one. Mm -hmm. My mom and I are very close and she's like a liberal, progressive, open-hearted person and we have like a really functional relationship with a lot of communication. And so it made sense for me to talk to her about it. And she was like super receptive. I think what she said though was like, well, I don't really care. I don't really care what gender you are. I know. And when I tell people that, like their eyebrows shoot up and they're like, whoa, what? That's dismissive. Yeah. And I was like, no, it felt great. Yeah. Because I didn't want, like, that was my fear with my mom is that she, it was going to be like a thing. Right. And she was like, it's not a thing. And it took a while. And she got it. She got all the language stuff. I think maybe, I think maybe it's been like a year since I talked to my mom about it. Maybe longer than that. I don't know. But she uses they when she talks about me on Facebook <laughs> and calls me her child. And she like makes joke, private jokes about it to me. She's like, well, my adult child, how are you? And things like that. And within the context of our relationship, that feels like really caring and really supportive to me. So it works. The piece... I want to thank you for sharing that yeah. story. The piece that I really want to highlight is it's really small changes mm -hmm. people can broadly make. Like just changing how what pronouns we use. Yeah. Even that sort of degendering of restrooms. Yeah. And you just described it reducing so much of your daily stress. Yeah, I was just shocked by by what a change it made for me. I didn't imagine that it would be that big right. of a difference or that it would even work. It was an experiment, you know? Yeah. And you know, some experiments don't work. Sometimes you're like, well, this feels ooglier than before. Yeah. Retracted. And I was fully expecting it to be. I was like, this is going to be awkward and weird. And I'm going to feel like I'm asking for too much. And actually, it felt really comfortable. And I'm someone who's really, like, I'm sort of obsessed with being accommodating. Yeah, and... you, you, you do customer service through your life. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I was really, that was my biggest fear. And then it felt so good that I was like, well, it's important for me to actually take care of this boundary. And, like, not just encourage people to cross this boundary and make me uncomfortable all the time just for the sake of their own comfort. And what I found talking to my cisgender friends for whom I'm, like, the first gender nonconforming person they've been close friends with... What I found is that most of them are like, I think all of them are like, wow, I really appreciate this. Thank you. So that really helps me deal with some of my anxiety of like asking too much. It lets people like better love and connect with you. Yeah. And because... I mean, some people it doesn't. Some people are like, ooh, this is hard. I'm a real piece of shit. <laughs> and like, I don't know why and people the... say that, but they I know they just time. declare it. It's yeah. actually convenient. They it's just helpful. let me know. Yeah. It's on their name tag. <laughs> I prefer there's a of line shit. of there's a line of apparel that's yeah. available, but is it what is it? Uh... So... <laughs> we could develop tap it. out. I think it's yes, on it. yes, it's ally tap out. So some people just don't not not only it's not that they can't do it, it's that they don't make the effort. So here's a here's a window into like like for folks who are like afraid of screwing it up. Here's what I try to make clear to people. If someone calls me she, I never get called he because I'm like a big, fat, curvy person with a magnificent rack and like it's just never going to happen. I would be so much more comfortable with people accidentally calling me sir or he than mm -hmm. calling me like she or ma'am, miss or girls or, or whatever. Yeah. I got girls last night mm -hmm. at a restaurant for the first time in like 20 years. Were you I having was like, apple teenies or something? No, I was That's the thing. I was like, well, what a fun gal's night out afterwards. <laughs> this, this woman was like, all right, girls, have a great night. And I was like, I am... I am an adult. You weren't <laughs> at camp just I, now. You know, and like inside, I'm just sort of like, a, I'm like an irascible gay grandpa, really, inside of me. And like, I know, I know, like there's no way. No, I laugh because it's accurate. You totally gonna, are. No one's ever going to know that. Just passing me by on the street because yeah. I, you know, I look like, I look like I should be like 
in a line waiting for the new local Lane Bryant to open up, yeah, right? Yeah. So, and it doesn't matter how many, like... Or Katie Lang tickets. Or, really? You are, speaking know. of a grandpa... How dated is it? Like, well, you said grandpa, so I wanted I know, to, like, that's age true. you. Well, yeah, and I, I often... trying to play your game. Okay, no, welcome, welcome. So, the, a lot of times in, like, queer spaces, mm-hmm. like, it's really easy for me to be read as a, a charming Gen X lesbian, you know? Which is, like, oh, that's not completely unheard of. Sure. Like, there, there's a me in an alternate universe who, like, settled into that, probably. So it doesn't offend me. But I would be much more comfortable being misgendered as a dude. Mm. That's that's just where I, I lie on the gender spectrum. But it ain't never going to happen. And that will never happen. And so when somebody says she or her or or you go girl like that kind of thing just like a just some whatever some turn of phrase or something that has like feminine genderedness to it to me and it's someone who's like in my circle and knows that that's not me and they say that sometimes they I think they think that that's the ultimate crime but it's not at all everybody missteps like language is full of gender you can't avoid it it's you can't you can't not step on the grass when you're in the park, you know, like it's there and everybody says the wrong words sometimes. And so that's not, that's not the offense. The offense is acting like it's not a big deal. So the thing that hurts me is when someone says she, 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 her, her, whatever other kind of language. And I know I've had a talk with them about the language. I prefer the language that actually fits me. And they never acknowledge that they screwed up because maybe they're like too afraid to really like go there and be like, wow, I bet I hurt you. So it feels easier for them, I think, to just sort of gloss over it, pretend like they didn't notice that they made the mistake. Or maybe they genuinely don't notice. But if it happens a whole bunch of times, then I'm kind of like, how are you not realizing this? Did you forget or something? So it's it's the reaction out of fear, like pretending that the mistake wasn't made. That's the thing that that hurts me. And so I'm never, if anything... The, the other thing that's hard is like helping some like mit, helping mitigate somebody else's like stress over the mistake they made. It's funny that our fear can make us do more damage. Yeah, yeah, than and just the, being the, the it's not hilarious. No, I know it's, what you mean. <laughs> the uh, I mean it's pretty funny. The uh, I mean it is it is inherently hilarious though. If people aren't familiar with the concept of like emotional labor, Hmm. I think sometimes things just feel hard and impossible. But Hmm. if you're familiar with that, then you're like, okay, this is just going to take some work. Hmm. So just sort of acknowledging that it's not like a black and white situation of like, you've said the wrong word. You're never going to be a good ally. Go directly to hell. Like that's not what, (laughs) that's not actually how life works. If someone says the wrong pronoun, it doesn't wound me. It's just like, oh, (laughs) and then if they fix it, that's actually really encouraging. I'm like, yeah, we're on this, we're on the right path together. Cause like I screw up people's pronouns sometimes and I'm supposed to be like the one who knows it all and is perfect at it. Cause I do it right. Like if I, I think maybe there's this idea that if, if I expect people to use gender neutral pronouns for me, then I should be perfect at it, but I'm not. And I actually had to deal with that for a little while. The fact is like our brains are our brains and they, you know, we can, we can create elasticity if we practice but we get really set in our ways when it comes to language. And that's just how brains work. That doesn't mean somebody doesn't support me or whatever. Well, so I usually try to close on somebody's like, here's how you can help. But I feel like you've yeah. touched on it. Like the field trip thing at Target is a, or yeah. whatever a store is a great idea. Sort of live in the mistakes, I think you've said. Yeah, just beautiful. like be there. And, and then there's a really cool, there's an organization called Think Again Training that they have like a really cool like little workbook handbook okay. for allies and it's sort of designed as like a work training but you can use it in your personal life too sure. and it's about like pronouns and what they can teach us about gender and there are actually some really cool exercises in there that make me think of like improv exercises oh, cool. <laughs> that are like ways to practice pronoun flexibility like in your own brain so that when someone tells you their pronouns you can be a little more like mentally prepared like your language centers can be a little more receptive to that right off the Mm. bat so there's things like give your household objects genders and like when you go into your kitchen talk to your coffee maker talk about your coffee maker and be like oh he's making coffee this morning Mm. what a good boy that coffee maker is and then after a week switch it Mm. and like practice being like just thinking to yourself you don't have to talk out loud unless you want to appear to be like having a problem it's more fun yeah, you totally can. So for folks who are still really struggling with 
just feeling like icky and awkward about everything and like like they can't really handle that feeling and they're feeling kind of fragile around it that's a thing that you gotta just work through and i really like this book because it's it acknowledges that and then it's like but really you're okay yeah. all right pick yourself up and <laughs> learn some skills and you're gonna be okay like you're gonna be fine <laughs> So it's encouraging. It's just like, it's like a nice dad that's yeah, like yeah. telling you like, you screwed up. That's okay. You're going to get better at it. Right. High fives. I mean, you can't borrow the car for a while. Right. But, you know, like you're still grounded, but you're going to be okay. Yeah, we like I still you. love you. So I, that might be a great resource for people to start with. If they're great. like, no, for real, I got to get good at this fast. And I yeah. feel really weird about it. it. It could give people a leg up. But other than that, just like, listen, listen to your friends. Go on the internet and don't comment on things. <laughs> just yeah. like, just read a lot. It's it's one of those things where like it's not gonna hurt to just like read as much information as you can and about like queer and trans identities. And there are so many people out there writing really smart, awesome stuff. So that's that stuff is really easy to find. Is there a place you would send people if they wanted to connect with you or find out about things that you're up to? I don't know if you have a, yeah. a clearinghouse. Yeah, I mean, I run a I run a plus size clothing swap for all genders that called the Big Fat Super Swap that is on the internet, yeah. so people can look that up. And I I think it might be interesting for folks like if they're curious what it looks like to be trans inclusive and like gender accessible and gender inclusive. That's a project that I do that is focused around fat experience and fat folks of all genders. So. It's it's kind of like a interesting like intersectional thing because I it's for fat people yeah and so the language is focused around that but I also want it to be inclusive for people of all genders so there's a lot of language around that too that's sort of built in so um, that might be interesting for people even if they're not fat well thanks Hannah a lot for talking to me it has been a pleasure thanks for thanks for opening up this conversation. That was my conversation with Hannah. I hope you enjoyed it because I certainly did. There are links to the resources Hannah mentioned in the show notes. I really appreciate Hannah's time and openness. And thanks to Taj for leaving a voicemail for this episode. If you want to share a story or response to this or any part of Not About You, leave a voicemail message by calling 612-361-9261. Or you can connect on Twitter at NotAboutYouPod or Facebook slash NotAboutYou. If you leave a review on iTunes, that helps more people find the show and spread these conversations. And always, I encourage you to share it with people you know and your various networks. The Not About You theme song is Rebels of Our Own Kind, written and performed by Twin Cities-based musician Charlie Vanstee. Thank you for listening. This is Not About You. Not About You.